are in part five of a series called Faith Works. I'm thankful for Jim bringing the message last week. And every week, James has been challenging us, calling us deeper. And again, James is a guy that gets right to the point. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't take a whole lot of time to say what he wants to say, what he wants his audience to hear. And so we're going to try to try to take a lesson from James and, and do the same this morning as well to, to get to the meat of the matter, the heart of the matter so that all of us will be challenged, so that all of us will be confronted at times even by the reality of what we've been called into, but sometimes we know fall short of. And thank God there is grace for that. But there is a call to something deeper and bigger than what we many times live into. And James is going to point that out to us this morning. Well, I think about this word evidence. And, and just for a second, puzzle over this word with me, evidence. What, what is evidence? What is this word all about and where does this actually matter? Well, the dictionary defines the word evidence this way. Evidence is the available body of facts indicating whether a belief or a proposition is true or valid. Now, you may be thinking in your mind, okay, I know what evidence is and I know some places where evidence applies. And I took some time to think through this this week as, as well. You know, one of the ways that I think that evidence matters is when we're looking to solve a crime, when somebody is looking to solve a crime, when a detective is out trying to find clues so that he or she can bring that crime to a conclusion, a resolution. You know, many of us love evidence as it relates to solving a crime as evidenced by the fact that we watch shows like CIS and that there are like 12 different CISs at this point in time, and NCISs, and all these other things, right? And Cold Case, and all, all these different shows where evidence is at the heart of the matter. Where a detective, where a group of detectives, where a whole bunch of people have to come together, find the evidence so that they can together solve the crime. Well, then we take this one step further, and evidence matters when we go to the next step in the court of law. Evidence matters there as well. And guess what? There's a hundred different shows out there as well that show why evidence matters in the court of law. And every now and then, just because I like to torture myself, I'll turn one of the shows on like Judge Judy, right? <clears throat> Everybody should inflict a little bit of pain on themselves from time to time. It keeps us humble. But there are other shows that we like watching, right? I mean, remember Matlock? I mean, Matlock would go to the court of law. How about Law and Order? I mean, you've seen some of these shows, right? We understand how evidence matters in the court of law. Well, what about coming to a scientific conclusion? I mean, evidence matters here as well. We're supposed to follow the facts, and the facts lead us to a conclusion, and, and together we're able to figure this out. And there's lots of shows that do this as well. In fact, many documentaries follow this chain. They follow the evidence scientifically to try to figure something out. Evidence matters. Or when making a medical diagnosis, evidence matters. In fact, one of my favorite shows for a while was a show called House. Anybody ever watch House? There are lots of other shows that, that deal with this same kind of subject matter as well, making a med medical diagnosis. When we're trying to figure out what is going on in someone's body, the evidence matters. And sometimes we can't just see exactly what it is, but we have this fact and this fact and this fact. Put those facts together and we're figuring something out now. Now we're coming to some so sort of conclusion. And so you can see that we recognize in many places in life that evidence matters, that evidence is important. Well, this week, as we jump into this next section of James, I want you to keep this idea in mind because James is actually going to bring up the question of evidence. He's going to bring up the question of evidence. So if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to open up to James chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 14 through 26 this morning. I'll be reading primarily out of the NIV, although we will jump into the NLT for a little bit this morning as well. So this is what James says, beginning in James chapter 2, verse 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, 
You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, not even Rahab the prostitute was considered righteous for what she did when she even was not considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. These are the words of James from James 2, 14 through 26. Okay, so we're going to take the next few minutes to try to pull these apart because there may have been a tension, and we'll kind of try to address that tension as we get there together. There may have been a tension that came up in you as you read some of James' words. James begins by asking this question, and we're going to see he actually does this several times in this text. He'll ask a question, give an example, and then he's got something he wants us to hear out of that. He's going to make a statement. Question, example, statement. So James will do this several times. This is where he begins. By asking a question, he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. So here's his example. This example actually goes back to what Jim preached on last week. He actually reconnects with this idea of not showing favoritism and actually engaging with people who are maybe in a different social standing than we are. To not let our high social standing, if, they, if we have high stand, social standing, impact the fact that we, we need to engage with people of low social standing or to not show preference in our assemblies or anywhere else in life for that matter. And so James says, let me, let me bring up an example to you of someone who doesn't have daily clothes or daily food. Okay, doesn't have enough clothes and doesn't have enough food to even eat. James says, then let's suppose, let's just suppose, let's, let's think together on this one for a second. What if you said to that person, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed. So what if you wish that person well? You saw a person in need and you patted him on the, de- on the back and wished him a good day. Now, we know that that would do nothing for that person, right? I mean, in fact, it might even make them feel worse because they might feel patronized by what we had just done, but they certainly wouldn't feel satisfied by what we had just done. And so James says, if we do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Okay, so he asks a question. He gives us an example. And now James is going to make this statement. In the same way, faith by itself if not accompanied by action, is dead. Question, what good is it? What good is faith without evidence of faith? Here's an example. What about this poor person who doesn't have enough? And then out of it, here's this statement. Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, I'm going to acknowledge, again, as I did earlier on, that there is a tension here, is there not? Because on some, on some level, it seems as though James is actually saying that works and salvation connect, that there's a connection between works and salvation. I mean, that, that's what it seems like, right? Again, James says, can such a faith save this person? And the reality is, if we didn't have Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, maybe we wouldn't feel so tense about that. But we do have Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, and sometimes it seems like there is a headbutting between what James says and what Paul says. 
But I want you to see that what James and what Paul say are actually two very similar things. Now, before we do that, I want to remind you who James is writing to. James is writing to the 12 scattered tribes of Israel, to the scattered tribes of Israel, to those who were in Jerusalem, who've now endured persecution and have now been pushed out into the neighboring towns, eventually as far as Antioch and then beyond. They've now been scattered through persecution. So I want you to just take a second and put yourself in the shoes of someone who had endured persecution in their hometown to the point that it made them flee their hometown and find themselves a new town. I mean, just put yourself in the shoes of that person. Walk a mile in their shoes. Let's say you you grew up in Jerusalem. All your family was there. Your friends were there. Here comes Jesus onto the scene, and maybe he's interesting to you. Maybe it's not until after the resurrection, like James, that you start to follow Jesus. And a time goes by in Jerusalem where the church is flourishing. And in Acts 2, we actually see that they found favor with everybody. But then a few short chapters later comes the first wave of persecution. And then comes the first martyr. And then comes more intense persecution. And then they're driven out to the surrounding towns. And they find themselves even going across country lines. Everywhere they went, they become persecuted. How would you be likely to respond to that? I don't know. I I might get a little bit more quiet in the way that I've been living because, boy, persecution is no fun. I've been driven out of my hometown, driven away from my family. Maybe it was even in some cases my family, my friends, my former family and friends that persecuted me. And I might wonder, should I keep doing the thing that's gotten me in trouble right now? Should I keep going? And I think some of the early Christians were struggling with this. In fact, we see extra biblical texts that support this idea that there were some who were struggling. Should I keep on being vocal about my faith? Or maybe should I take a step back for just a little while? And so as James is addressing these people, these scattered tribes of Israel, He's talking to people who've endured persecution and are struggling with a question. Do I keep living this faith out loud? Do I keep sharing my faith out loud? What do I keep doing? How do I address this reality in my life that I've just been pushed out of my hometown? I'm living somewhere else. I have no roots anymore. And these are the people that James is addressing. Again, back to the tension. And we're actually going to deal with Paul's words from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. He says, for it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay, if you've not been familiar with this tension, maybe now you're seeing some of the tension that exists between James' words, or that looks like it exists anyway, between James' words and Paul's words. James says, look, i got to see your faith in action, and then I'll know. And Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's it's not by works. I I don't want anybody to be able to boast. I, I want you to know this is a gift of God. But the reality is, we often forget that Paul's next words, in his next words, he speaks directly to this idea of works. Now, see what he does with it. Paul says this, For we, we, those who've been saved and redeemed, we are God's handiwork. In fact, he just spends this whole chapter, the beginning of this chapter, to the Ephesian Christians, Paul talks about the fact that we used to be dead in our sin, but now we're alive in Christ. So we're alive in Christ. We're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Yeah, you can say it out loud. To do good works. We've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And then catch this piece, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, if we take James' words and Paul's words and we put them together and we actually understand the situation that James was writing into, I think we can conclude this fairly safely, that good works do not save us. Let's be clear about this, church. 
We have to be clear about this. You cannot work your way into heaven. You can't. You cannot earn God's grace. It is a free gift. But while good works do not save us, the kind of faith in Jesus that saves will lead one into good works. I mean, that's exactly what Paul says. It's exactly what James says. Saving faith leads us into living a faithful life. Now, here's the piece, again, that we can sometimes miss about this. It will lead us into good works that God has prepared, pre-planned, predestined. God has put in front of us these good works for us to live into them. And so in Paul's words, here's what I can see, that not even my good works can I take credit for. My good works are a product of the goodness of God living in me. Your good works are a product of the goodness of God living in you. A few years ago, I started praying a prayer actually out of these short verses from Ephesians. And I'll share with you the story that kind of inspired me into that as we close the message in a few minutes this morning. So we'll come back to this in a second, but, but I want you to see, if this is true, then a prayer that we ought to be praying as followers of Jesus, as faithful followers of Jesus, often is this, God, lead me into the good works that you have prepared in advance for me. God, I want you to lead me into these good works because I want to be faithful. And I don't want to have a dead faith. What I want to have on the other side of that is a living faith that produces faithfulness. And what we see in both the example of James and Paul, they agree fully. In fact, I think if you got those guys in the room, they'd say, we're saying the same thing. We just got different ways of saying it. But what they would agree on is that living faith produces, leads to faithfulness in our lives. So back to James. James says this, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith, says James, without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, th this is a little confusing, or the structure of this sentence is a little confusing in the original language. In fact, you may be scratching your head when you read this because you're trying to figure out who's saying what in this. Is this a hypothetical? Is somebody talking to James? The NLT does a really good job of parsing this out. In fact, many scholars agree that what this text should say is, now someone may argue, some people have faith, right? Some people have faith. And then there are these others who have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. And so what James is arguing for is a living faith that is touchable, tangible, and a faith in a sense that there is evidence of. I think James, what James is asking is this, is where is the evidence of your faith? And again, remember, he's talking to a, a persecuted people who are now living in foreign lands at times where they're scared and they're not sure, should we continue to speak up? Should we continue to live this life in public faithfully? Should we do this? And James says you ought to live in a way that there is evidence of the faith you say you claim. You ought to live that way. James says, you believe that there is one God. Okay, so you have this belief. You have this belief. You believe there is one God. Good. In fact, I think James acknowledges this as a starting point. This is a starting point. This is a good place to begin. If you don't believe there's one God, then James would say, okay, we've got something else we've got to figure out. But James says, you believe that there is one God. Good. But don't allow yourself to stop there. James says, let me tell you this hard truth. Even the demons believe that. 
And it moves the demons to this place where they shudder. They're shaking when they think about God. When they think about the evidence of God, the reality of God, the demons shudder. So James says, listen, we've got to go beyond this. He says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? And here we miss this in most of our English translations, but James is actually, I, he, I think he tries to lighten the discussion just a little bit because he throws in a play on words here. And what James actually says is this. He says, faith without works does not work. Okay, so back here right where we normally read, Faith without deeds is useless. In the original Greek, it actually says, faith without works doesn't work. It's broken in a sense. So here's where James returns to his question, example, and statement mode. So here he goes with the question. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions, they were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was God's friend. Question. Again, Writing to a Jewish audience, James says, hey, you guys know Abraham. You guys know the story of his life. You know the way he lived. You know the way he moved. You know how faithful he was. In fact, in the question is the example. So he says, let me ask you about Abraham. Now think about Abraham. And then James makes this statement. Abraham's faith was made complete by what he did. Or, put another way, we could say that Abraham's faith was shown to be a living faith by the way he lived. Right at the end of this, James comes back and he kind of changes up the order so you know that he's wrapping up his argument with this. But he does throw in here another example in just a second. He says, you see that a person is considered righteous. So he begins with the statement this time. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, he says, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. And then James concludes this section with these words, as the body without the spirit is dead, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Well, James says some pretty important things in this section of text. One, one of the things that he does is actually ask us a question in a sense. He says, where's the evidence of your faith? And he asked the early Christians who were reading his letter, he asked them this question, where is the evidence of your faith? How do I know that you have faith? And this is a question that every now and then I need to stop and I need to ask myself, where is the evidence of my faith? Is there evidence of my faith? Or are they just words? James also makes a pretty bold statement in saying this, even though he kind of does this, it seems like somewhat tongue-in-cheek. He says, faith without works doesn't work. So I think when we're asked that question, when we hear statements like that, it ought to lead us to be asking a question of ourselves as well, or at least to be wondering some things ourselves as well. And my, my question is, okay, so if that's the way things are, if that, if that living faith produces faithfulness, if that is true, if that God has called me, prepared in advance for me, good works to do, then what should I do? And I think it can be summed up in this. God, lead me into the good works that you have prepared in advance for me. There's a story told of a, a little girl who was actually really impacted by the words of Ephesians 2. And she started praying these words fairly early on. She would pray these words and she believed that God had truly created in advance, prepared in advance, good works for her to do. And in that, that she was God's masterpiece, 
which is what the Apostle Paul says. God's work of art. And I think she probably knew in her heart as well that even those good works she wouldn't be able to take credit for. They were God's that God had put in front of her to do, and she was just called to live them out faithfully. And so that young girl was moved to do some things that you and I would look at and say, boy, that's almost crazy. She left home and moved to a place where she knew there were lots of orphans and lots of people who were suffering. And she became a missionary. And people would from time to time send things. They would send clothes and they would send shoes and they would send other things to care for these orphans. Now, she was caring for these orphans. She needed shoes and she needed clothes as well, but often would wait for the end till the last after people were collecting these piles, you know, collecting shoes, getting shoes from these piles of shoes. Here's this pile of shoes. Here's this pile of clothes. And the kids would come sort through and figure out which ones they wanted. She'd help them figure out which ones they wanted. And oftentimes she would just take one of the last pairs. So much so that by the end of her life, her feet were deformed because she'd worn shoes that didn't fit for years. But she believed that every step along the way, she was doing what God had called her into. She believed that she was living into the good works that God had prepared in advance for her to live into. Now, here's the thing. You you know who this lady is. I mean, sometimes she's called Teresa of Calcutta. Sometimes she's called Mother Teresa. And the reality is, while we may not doctrinally line up with everything that Mother Teresa believed, her example ought still be a powerful one for us. To see someone who at a young age started praying. Here's the thing. Whatever age you are today, this is a prayer that you can start praying God, lead me into the good works that you've prepared in advance for me. I've tried to move beyond the place where I sit around and try to figure things out, knowing that if God, if this is true, what I need to do is look to be faithful to what God has already put out there. And the same is true for you as well. Living faith will produce faithfulness. So I want to pray over you this morning as a group that we will, as a people, resolve to pray before God. This is the prayer that I want you to pray this week. This is my challenge to you. Will you pray this week and ask God daily, God, what have you already prepared for me to do that you're just waiting for me to say yes to? Let's pray. God, as we see James' work and James' words and his challenges, we're we're confronted by the fact that that a faith without works is not a living faith. That, God, you have called us into so much more than just acknowledging with our mouths that you are God, but living our lives in such a way that reflects that you are God. God. So, Father, I pray for all of us this morning, for those who are watching, for those who are in this room, that, God, you will lead us faithfully, that we will respond faithfully to embrace those good works that you have already prepared in advance for us to do. And through that, we know we will be your church on mission in the gates of hell will not prevail. This we pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen.